All right, I think I'll get started. So thank you all for joining us. We're very excited to have you all here on this IMAP Invasive mobile app training. Hopefully it'll be a good thing to do outside as it starts to get warm again. Um, so I believe you are all muted and I will ask you to stay muted during the presentation, but please feel free to type into the chat box if you have any questions or comments as we go along. Uh, so today our presenters are myself, I am Mitch O'Neill, the End User Support Specialist for New York IMAP Invasives, uh, which is part of the New York National Heritage Program. And we're also very lucky to have Steve Young, the Chief Botanist with the New York National Heritage Program with us today to provide an overview on some species. Um, and we also have Meg Wilkinson, the program manager for IMAP Invasives at the New York National Heritage Program, and she'll be monitoring the chat box. Um, so that's who we are. And as I've seen some of you have already, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself into the chat box. I have a few prompts there if you want to answer those. It's been great to see your responses so far. And with that, I think I'll start with a brief introduction. So again, we are part of the New York Natural Heritage Program, NYNHP for short. We work to facilitate conservation of New York's biodiversity. Um, so we do a lot of work with rare native species, but since invasive species pose such a threat to biodiversity, NYNHP has also developed the Invasive Species Database Program. We're most well known for running IMAP invasives in New York, but we are also involved in a number of other projects. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, we define invasive species as plants, animals, insects, and pathogens that are, one, not native, so they come from somewhere else, and two, they are negatively impactful, so some sort of harm to the environment, the economy, or human health. Um, this, the picture on the right, I have slender false brome. Uh, you can see that it's just covered the entire understory. It's outcompeted all the native plants. Um, and these infestations can prevent new trees from growing. Uh, they're not palatable to wildlife. Uh, so these can really change these ecosystems and harm native communities. And so these invasives are a huge problem, but the question is, what can we do about it? And a lot of work has gone into answering that question, and the main theory we've come up with is that managing an invasive species, the best way to manage it depends on where it is on this invasion curve. So as time goes on, a species will show up and then it will become more abundant. So when the species is not there yet, you can focus on prevention. Once it's started to get here, but it's only in small numbers, you focus on eradication, because at that point it's still possible. Eventually, there will be too many, and eradication is no longer feasible. And at that point, the priority would be containment, so not letting the species spread into areas where it's not infested yet. And really, the main takeaway is that the earlier we are on the curve, the better off we'll be, because Prevention and eradication of small populations is a lot cheaper than uh, containment and long-term management strategies. And so in order to figure out how to address an invasive species, we need to understand its current distribution, see which strategy will be the best one. And we also have to be proactive and keep our eyes out for invasives that might not even be here yet or they're only here in small numbers. As an example, here's the current distribution of slender false brome. The red shows where there are confirmed uh, presence records, and then the light-colored yellow dots show where people have surveyed for it but did not find it. So it looks like in those red areas, we would want to focus on containing it, so not letting it spread elsewhere. And in the other areas, we would be focusing more on prevention or eradicating small populations if those are found. But one big question for species like slender false brome that we have like just started focusing on is uh, what is going on in these areas where there is no data? So is this 
an area where the plant has, it just isn't there yet, and that's why we haven't recorded it, or have we just not noticed it yet because it's only just come onto our radar? And this is a data gap that we are going to be asking you all to help us fill. And another thing I'll mention about some of these species is that they can be challenging to identify at first. Um, so if I was walking down a trail and I saw this clump of grass on the side, I might not even think anything about it. It just looks like an innocent plant. Um, but luckily we have Steve Young who will show us the different features of some of these plants that you can look to to notice it in the field and identify it. So we're very lucky to have that component as, as a part of this training as well. And this brings me to IMAP invasives. So several jurisdictions across North America use IMAP invasives. In New York, it's the Centralized Invasive Species Database, and we use it to support PRISMs, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. So you can use IMAP to uh, show species distributions and reports. Um, we have email alerts to uh, professionals on key species so that they'll know when a new species is found in the region. And we also offer web map services and ways to track and track your control efforts and the results of those control efforts. As I just mentioned, PRISMs, uh, those are partnerships for regional invasive species management. New York is divided into eight of these regions. So you can look at this map and see where you fall. And I really encourage everyone who hasn't already to Google their PRISM, uh, connect with them on their website. They have listservs, um, they have social media and websites you can uh, look to for more information and to stay connected on invasive species projects in your region. So they're a really great resource. And so with this IMAP invasive database, uh, where does the data come from? So we started with uploads of existing data from partner organizations, including uh, agencies, uh, nonprofits, museums, and these provided a really great snapshot of what invasive species distributions looked like at that time. But the thing with invasive species distributions is that they are always shifting. So we really need continuous data entry and sense at IMAP, we focus on maintaining the database, and New York is such a huge state, so it's hard to um, have any one entity uh, survey the entire state. We really rely on community scientists and professionals all across the state to help us maintain and add data to this database. And Sorry about that. Okay, and um, this is why we've made the IMAP mobile app so you can record invasives and take pictures that experts can then confirm um, after the fact so that we can provide this high quality comprehensive database of invasives in New York. So we really value everyone who's on this call because New York State really uh, relies on you and benefits from the volunteer work you do with uh, looking for and reporting invasive species. But, so for today's agenda, first I am going to give a IMAP invasives training. So by the end of this webinar, anyone who's interested should be able to uh, log into their IMAP invasives account and they should be able to report a record on the IMAP mobile app. And then the second part of this webinar will be a training on some key underreported plant species from our chief botanist, Steve Young. Um, and we're very excited for that. A lot of interesting species. Uh, for example, that third picture is water meal. It poses a huge threat, but it's also just such an interesting plant to learn about. And before I dive into using IMAP, I want to make sure okay. we all understand the distinction between the mobile app and the online web application. So the mobile app is uh, where you can record invasive species in the field. 
You get that from the App Store. And then the online web application, you access that through a browser. You can be on your computer or your phone or another device, and that's where you can uh, look at and download all the data at imapinvasives.natureserve.org. And we recommend using Chrome or Firefox, or if you're on an iPhone, then use Safari. And this is where we'll start with the training because this is how you set up your account. So it's pretty easy. You just go to nyimapinvasives.org and hit the log in to get to this imapinvasives.natureserve.org. And you'll see two different places where you can enter information. If you already have an account, you log in at the top with your information. Um, if you haven't signed in in a while, you might have to do this forgot password. Um, especially if it was uh, last spring or even earlier since we uh, didn't update to the database. And then if you don't have an account, you can sign up here. So you enter your information um, and you pick New York for your jurisdiction. And then this will send an email to your email. And there will be a link in that email where you can access the user agreement. And once you read that and accept it, you'll be all ready to log in to uh, I'm at. And I also just want to mention that if anyone doesn't have their account yet, please feel free to follow along here. And if anyone has any issues, uh, just enter them into the chat box. So when you log in, it looks like this. There's always a message for uh, updates to the database or updates to the website. And once you have yourself all up to date there, you can close that out. And I'll just give you a brief orientation of where everything is on the site. There's this main menu on the top left. This is navigation tools on the left side. Action tools on the top. So here you can filter records for, you could put your own name in to see where all your records are. You could filter on certain species. Um, and this is also where you can export data or species lists. And then on the right side, we have these geographic layers. So this is how you control what you're seeing on the map. So you can choose between uh, present points or not detected points, et cetera. And we're going to start by looking at the main menu because this is where you uh, look at your account. Now last everyone to please remain muted um, one second um, so okay. so this is what your account page looks like you go to the main menu and select the your account and you'll find your information and there are also uh, some boxes below your information called organizations and projects And just to briefly mention what those are, so organizations are a great way to group data from multiple users in one organization. These are usually staff only. So if you are collecting invasive species data as a part of your job, you probably want to join their organization. If you're a volunteer, you probably don't have to worry about organizations, but you might be interested in projects. So this is another way to group data, um, but these include people who are staff members, people from various organizations, and volunteers who don't have an official affiliation. For example, we have the IMAP mapping challenge each year, and we always make that a project that volunteers can join. So if you do want to join an organization, you hit the edit button on the top right of your account page, scroll down to request to join an organization, you type in your organization and click request to join. And once you press save on the top right corner, it'll save that change and you'll be a pending member until an admin uh, accepts your, in, uh, your request to join the organization. And then one last part of setting up your account is optional email alerts. So these were set up so that state officials would be alerted to observations of new species. Um, but anyone can use these alerts to stay informed on a species that they're interested in. 
for instance, you could set the alert on a species you're interested in in your region. Um, and the way to do that is to go to this your email alerts button on the main menu and you can opt in and out of alerts that are already set up and you can also add custom alerts for like more detailed uh, email alerts. And so now anyone should be all set up with their IMAP account. So now we can switch to the mobile app. And again, anyone can follow along. My hope is that you'll all be able to submit a test record to make sure the app is functioning today. So you go to your app store, uh, either the Apple App Store or Google Play, and you download this IMAP Invasives mobile app. And this just has, the, I, I like to think of the workflow for the app as a sandwich. So for the first step, you need connectivity to set up the app, uh, but then you're all set to go out into the field uh, without connectivity. But for the third step, for the bottom slice of bread, you need connectivity again to be able to upload the data to the database. And I'm gonna start at this account setup so when you open up your app, it'll either bring you to this green screen or it will bring you straight to this preferences. If it brings you to the green screen, then you just have to click on the menu on the top left and then go into preferences. And so you put in your email and passwords from the account you just made, and then you hit this retrieve list button and you should get this successful message. Um, that it has retrieved your list successfully. If you don't get this message, uh, just try retyping your username and password. Make sure you're able to log in on the online if it's still not working. And one tip is that sometimes phones add in a space after the password because they think you're writing a sentence. So just make sure that doesn't happen. And then, so once you get that success message, you are really all set to go, but I like to make people aware of some of these more detailed preferences that they can set. I usually, uh, I, I set mine to common species because that's easier for me to identify species by. And then there's this customized species list. So this is really useful because there are tons and tons of species on the list. So this saves you from having to scroll through species when you are using the app. So you can add some species you're interested in. Um, I have a type, I have a list of species here that we're going through today. I see one typo, it's actually calorie pear. And I tried to list the species in alphabetical order so you can select them as you're scrolling through if you want to add these species to your list. And I also have fake species on here because we use that for testing. And the rest of the defaults are usually fine. And you can also enter your default projects if you want to set those. Um, if you don't see any projects, um, that's because the order is very important. So you have to go back to your account and join the organization or project. And once you are, once you know that you are a member of that organization, you select retrieve IMAC list again to sort of refresh your app. And then, and then you will be able to set your organization and projects to default. And of course, save your changes. All right, so at this point, everyone's app should be all set up and we can, we are now able to go out into the field without connectivity to record species. Um, you can also do this just wherever you're sitting right now without leaving connectivity and it will also work. So you click this, add observation button on the green screen. I'm gonna ask everyone to follow along and you can enter a fake species with me if you haven't done so before. You click that add observation button and it brings you to this screen where you can take a picture. You can enable or disable your custom species list. You select the species so everyone can select fake species and uh, you select whether you detected the species or not. And then as you scroll down, it will show you a map 
And I'll note that this might be blank if you are outside of connectivity. Um, but the way to tell whether it's working is the coordinates. So there's a location uh, box and it has some coordinates in there. If you have zero, zero, that means you need to make sure GPS is enabled on your device. Um, but if it's displaying a nice long number like it is in this picture, then you are all set even if the map is blank. And your default projects will show up. You can feel free to change those. And there's also this option to enter the time you search for invasive species. Um, that's optional. So if you were just walking down the trail and you happen to find one, you can leave this blank. This is really for if you're doing some sort of uh, formal survey. And if you have any more comments, you can feel free to enter those there. And save your changes. And one thing I'll note is those pictures that you take are very important. So good pictures are essential because this is how our experts can confirm data so that it can actually be used by New York State. So on the left, I have some blurry pictures of hemlock woolly adelgid. It's kind of hard to see whether these are just clumps of snow or if they are this invasive insect that leaves woolly masses on hemlock trees. Um, it's kind of hard to tell because it's not in focus. So here's another example where it's in, in focus. Um, we really need a nice in focus close up picture. Um, some tips are to put your hand behind it or a sheet of paper. That'll help it focus and provide some scale. And so with that, we have gone through the first two steps. You have collected the data. I hope some of you were able to collect a fake species record. Um, and now we are ready for the last step, which is uploading records to IMAP. So if you had gone out into the field, you would need to come back to connectivity to be able to upload these records to the online database. So if you successfully recorded an observation, it will show up as a yellow card on your main screen. Um, there's a little pencil icon if you want to go in and edit or double check details. Um, and if you're ready to submit it, you can check this box here and then go up to the menu and select Upload Selected. And it will ask you if you are sure. So when you press OK, it will upload the database and your screen will be green. The way you can tell whether you've uploaded your, your record or not is if it's still there. So if it's a yellow card on your screen, that means it's still on your device and it has not been uploaded to the database. If your screen is blank and green, that means all of your records have been submitted. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that at my first training, my card was red and it wouldn't let me submit it. And so that actually happens if you forgot to select a species. So I just had to go into that edit button, add in the fake species, and then my card was yellow and I was able to upload it. And if there are any questions, please enter them into the chat box. And at this point, um, the data is no longer on the phone. So if you want to view it, you can go to the online web application. And uh, so we might have time for this at the end of the webinar, but I'm not going to do anything live right now because I want to make sure we have time to get to the species that Steve is going to present. But some things that you can do online is use the filter tool. You can filter for yourself. Um, if we have time, I'll filter on fake species. So you'll see all of your records pop up across the street. And um, you can also use some other tools like exporting data, um, exporting species lists by geography, and adding distribution maps. And again, make sure you're using these recommended browsers. And I did have to go through that somewhat quickly. So please ask questions in the chat box and we'll go over some of them at the end. Um, but also feel free to look at these resources we have online. So we have the nyimapinvasives.org website. We have the New York IMAP help desk. So that email goes to me. And we have IMAP invasives. Uh, the network also has their own website with some help resources. 
And at this point, we've gone through the IMAP training. Um, so hopefully all of you are able to submit fake species records. And our next, um, our next topic today is these underreported plant, plant species that Steve Young is going to cover. Um, I'll just pause for a moment in case there are any questions that I should answer right now. So I think we'll move on. So I so, will. Mitchell, I didn't yes. I fast enough. So there's a couple I'll cover from the chat box in the chat box, but one I just did want to make sure people are aware. Um, the app is for points and presence and not detected. If you want to do polygons, um, you can either do that online or we have a more advanced app called the IMAP Mobile Advanced App um, yes, that Mitchell can also give a link to you about um, how to do that more advanced work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so with that, I think I'll hand it over to Steve. Steve Young, the Chief Botanist for the Natural Heritage, New York Natural Heritage Program. Okay, hey, thanks, Mitch. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So today I want to talk about invasive species that are under-surveyed and easily spread by humans or animals. And that includes a lot of species in New York. So I don't have time for all of those, but, and I just picked four species that I thought were pretty interesting. The first one is Japanese angelica tree. Aurelia elata. And you can see them here. There's a clone here on Long Island um, with these doubly compound leaves. And at the top, there's a white inflorescence, which you can't miss what it's in flower uh, midsummer. And these are uh, fairly small trees, and they do get larger than this. I'll show you some of that. Next slide. Lower Hudson Prism, if you want more information about it, they have a good fact sheet on Aurelia. And uh, you can go there and look at that fact sheet. Next slide. Here's a uh, smaller tree. And you can see the trunk is just, uh, has a lot of prickles on it. So it's, it's very prickly, something you don't want to grab onto. And <clears throat> it has, these large doubly compound leaves with these large clasping leaf bases. These are green, they can uh, be also red. Next slide. Here's a larger version. This is uh, in Amsterdam State Park in Montauk. And you can see the large trees, they, they get smoother bark as they get older. But still, towards the top of the tree, you'll see those prickles. <clears throat> this is Vicky Bustamante, who's doing a flora of Montauk, and took me out to see these trees at Amsterdam State Park. So they can occur in uh, wetlands, in wetland depressions. It can be on roadsides, uh, along railroad rights of ways, in many different habitats. But um, can form monocultures and they're difficult to eradicate because they do have um, sprouts if you cut them. Okay, next slide. Here's another shot of one of the smaller stems with the prickles on the stems. There's also prickles on the leaves too. So you can see those large leaf petioles which go out and branch once and then the leaves are on those secondary branches, doubly compound. And those prickles will go all the way out on those leaf petioles and actually in between where those opposite leaves come off the petioles. So it's prickly all over. You just don't want to, <clears throat> that's why it's so hard to uh, control these two because they're, they're hard to handle. Okay, next slide. Here's a close up of the inflorescence. You can see at the ends of the branches of the inflorescence, there are 
sort of a ring of white flowers. And on the upper right, you can see those flowers with white uh, pedicels and white petals. And then those flowers turn into a ring of purple black fruits, which um, very attractive. Also very attractive to birds. So that's one reason why these things spread so easily. Birds will they'll spread the seeds around. Okay. So we do have four other species of Aurelia in New York. And down in the lower right, you can see there's wild and bristly sarsaparilla and spikenard. And these species are herbaceous and Wild sarsaparilla is a herbaceous, small herbaceous plant in the understory. And hispida and racemosa are, they can get up to waist high or a little bit bigger, but they're not tree size. But there is one other one, Aurelia spinosa, which is tree sized. And it's very similar to Aurelia elata. And many of the uh, early identifications of Japanese angelica tree on Long Island especially were identified as devil's walking stick or the native Aurelia spinosa. But as far as we know, we only have the native Aurelia spinosa out in Western New York uh, along Lake Erie. <clears throat> but it's always a good thing to keep a lookout for. So the main difference between those two species is that Aurelia elata, the Japanese angelica tree, has its inflorescence branches that branch all from the base of the inflorescence. It doesn't have a central stalk. So you can see on Devil's Walking Stick, there's a central stalk to the inflorescence with branches coming off of that central stalk. So that's the main difference. So you have to look at the top of the tree when it's in flower to see that difference. Okay, next slide. Here's a map of Aurelia. Elata. You can see it, those uh, orange hexagons there at the bottom on all over Long Island and up into the lower Hudson area. And then there's some outliers farther north in Crisp and uh, Catmo Prism, one in the lower Adirondacks and way out in Rochester. So this is uh, spreading, but most of it is, is down in the lower Hudson Prism. And uh, that's where what I call the front line is. So next slide, you can see front line there is where you want to do a lot of the surveying. Of course, you want to survey around those outliers that are upstate too, to see if they've spread from there. But you want to be doing a lot of surveying on either side of that front line, because below that front line, you want to contain it, you want to contain a rail within that area. And above there, you want to exclude it from those other prisms. The um, people who work with invasive insects are very familiar with front lines. This, here's one for a Hemlock Woolley Adelgid, an article from the Lake George Land Conservancy about being on the front line, controlling that species up in the Southern Adirondacks. All right, the next one I want to talk about is um, calorie pear. And you're probably all familiar with calorie pear. It's a very popular landscaping plant. Around 1960, it was brought over here uh, as an experimental ornamental from China a long time ago, but really got popular in landscaping around 1960. And through the 60s up until now, it's been widely planted as a street tree and also see it a lot in parking lots. And um, uh, places where um, the um, environment is is more is difficult for other street trees. So here's on a street near where I live. There's one tree there in the front. You can see it has really spectacular blooms in the spring, and that's why it's planted a lot. And down the street there, you'll see another white tree. That's a a shad bush or a Juneberry. A really good native substitute for calorie pear if you want those white blossoms same time in the spring. These are early flowering 
um, in, uh, in usually in, in early May, late April and early May. So Bradford pear is one of the cultivars of calorie pear. Calorie is, is the uh, species name. Bradford is one of the cultivars. Next slide. So this tree has been escaping, especially in the Southeast US, <clears throat> and you'll see a lot of articles online about how terrible it has, has become in places like Maryland and Virginia up into Pennsylvania as an escape. It's just starting to do that in New York too. We've found it on Long Island and up into the lower Hudson area. So one you really wanna keep a watch out for in natural areas. So the, um, you can see the trunk on the left, usually a dark brown or almost black trunk, those longitudinal plates. And sometimes those plates are a little bit lighter, so it gives a kind of a stripy appearance to the bark. And then on the right, see the fruits that are produced after the profuse white flowers come out. And the fruits are like little um, brown little apples with a with a depression in the bottom. And they have orange speckles all over them. Those are pretty distinctive fruits. And the leaves are sort of an ovate leaf, wider at the bottom, and can be pointy or long pointed, and usually pretty shiny on the top. But one good character is that wavy leaf margin. See how the leaf margin has that wavy aspect to it. Okay, next line. And it has great fall color. It's another reason why it's planted because it has this really nice orange to red to yellow fall color. And you can see here sort of short pointed leaves and wavy margins, shiny leaf surface on the top. Okay. Here's a, a little grove of trees that has naturalized uh, along a highway in the lower Hudson prism uh, near 84, I-84. This is taken by Tom Lewis of Trillium Environmental Con uh, Invasive Control. So it is escaping and um, we want to control these now before they really become a big problem. Next slide. Here in the early spring, you can see again, some that have escaped along a woodland edge in the lower Hudson chapter. Probably this time of year is the easiest time to survey for them. And here's where they occur, mainly in the lower Hudson and Western Long Island, Staten Island, they've, they've escaped a lot and produced some monocultures down there. So I think more surveying is warranted in the lower Hudson and also Eastern Long Island. See, there are a few, a few um, outliers north of the front line there and the, up towards the Capmo Prism out in Binghamton. And then if you look way out in Western Pennsylvania there, a one that, that has been mapped in Bradford, Pennsylvania. Kind of interesting. But that Bradford, is not that name Bradford is not connected in any way to Bradford Pear. Two different people. They did that as a joke. So uh, also, we like to make sure that these are naturalized when you survey for these. So you wouldn't want to be putting trees into the database that are just in parking lots or uh, landscape trees, ones that have escaped into natural areas. Okay. Fourth species, the third species I want to talk about is Aldrovanda vesiculosa, great scientific name. It's called the water wheel plant. And this is an aquatic invasive species that has 
been introduced into southern New York, into the southern Catskills, uh, intentionally, because the person who introduced it wanted to preserve it. it. This is a globally rare plant, actually, where in its native range, it's very rare. And so some carnivorous plant enthusiasts wanted to plant it elsewhere to make sure that it wouldn't go extinct, not really thinking about what it could do to uh, the ecology of the plant, of the areas where they're introducing it. So Aldrovanda is native to the old world in, and even Australia into Asia and Europe and Australia. <clears throat> but again, a carnivorous plant enthusiasts got a hold of this and planted it in Virginia, New Jersey, and then in this a pond in New York. And here you can see it's a, um, an aquatic plant that has these whirls of leaves, look like, like long snakes with whirls of, leave, whirls of leaves. And at the ends of each whirl, is sort of what looks like a little Venus flytrap. And these are the little traps that trap the insects. It's a carnivorous plant. And uh, it, ha it uh, can be confused, next slide, for our native bladder warts. And we're concerned that it actually comes too common, it could outcompete our native bladderworts, which also feed on aquatic insects. And <clears throat> but to differentiate it from our native ones, the uh, natives have these little bladders all distributed throughout the leaves there, not right at the ends of the leaves. And they don't look quite like those Venus flytrap looking traps on, on water wheel. So this is greater bladderwort, Utricularia vulgaris macorrhiza. And you can see it does have whirls of branches, but it has those smaller bladders within there. Okay. And Aldrovanda also has a different flower. So the flower comes off the end of the stem, the top of the stem, and bladderworts can come off the uh, along the stem. But a big difference is utricularia or the bladderworts have an irregularly shaped flower and they're yellow. And Aldrovanda has white flower, which is more symmetrical, five petal flower. That's a good distinction there. I've seen Aldrovanda. Uh, during the summer, but I haven't I haven't seen it flower yet, so it'd be nice to see the flower sometime. Okay, next slide. Here's the habitat in the pond in uh, north of Port Jervis, down in the Southern Catskills, and this is very Adirondacky looking. It's a high elevation in the uh, Central Appalachian Plateau in an area that's not very developed there, <clears throat> but um, uh, this is a, a dwarf shrub bog, higher elevation, cold, um, very similar plants to bogs that you'll see in the Adirondacks. And then the Aldrovanda is in the open water there, under the, the water lilies and around the edges of the pond. It's uh, pretty much taken over the whole shoreline of, of this fairly big pond. And we're concerned that it will be spread by waterfowl to other places. So far, we haven't seen that, but we still haven't done enough surveys. And I think if pe more people are aware of this when they're out boating around in ponds, that um, they may be able to spot this. Hopefully it won't spread. Next slide. Here's where it is, those blue donuts at the bottom there. The, uh, the one in the southern Catskills, north of, of Fort Jervis. The dot, southernmost dot is a uh, occurrence in New Jersey that was planted at a mall. 
uh, at, like a wetland behind a mall. And then the dot in the middle turned up naturally, and they think it was probably distributed there, possibly by birds from the, the uh, mall wetland to the south. And then the, the northern dot in New York was also planted. This is where we know of it, uh, north of, of Virginia and Maryland. And again, concern that it will get into the rest of the Catskills and up into the Adirondacks. Could be transported by birds. Okay, next slide. Okay, the last species I want to talk about is, uh, is, a, is a challenging one. This is a, a grass, the slender false brome or Brachypodium sylvaticum. And the Finger Lakes prism has a nice fact sheet about it. If you go to the Finger Lakes prism website, you can get more information about it. Slide. And um, Western New York prism also has good information about slender false brown because it's mainly in those two prisms. You have identification information, and what it looks like in the understory, you can see forming a monoculture there in that in that forest understory. Okay, next slide. Just want to reiterate some of the characters to look for. If you're walking through the woods and you happen to see a grass that looks pretty common and, and it's a clumping grass, like if you're familiar with uh, Japanese stilt grass, it's not a clumping grass, it runs along the forest floor. This one is a clumping one. You can see how all the stems are together at the base there. And then the inflorescence comes out at the top and arches over. Pretty distinctive. Although there are a lot of brome grasses that do this too, but I'll show you the difference between those. Next slide. So the stem is very hairy, the sheath and the blade are hairy. And then at the base of the sheath, there's a hairy node there, just above where the stem or comb is visible above the sheath that's below it. So hairy stems, fine. And the inflorescence has spikelets. On the left, you can see an arrangement of spikelets along the stem there. And spikelets are, are the groups of flowers together. It almost looks like an elongated uh, ear of corn. Kind of how I think of it as a spikelet. And on the right, it shows those spikelets or those ears of corn just uh, stuck right on the, on the uh, stem. They're not, they don't have a, a pedestal below them. And then the spikelet also has these long awns at the top, sort of hair-like awns. Okay, next slide. Now the brome grasses, this Brachypodium is called slender false brome. It looks like a brome, but the brome grasses have these, their little ears of corn are on long pedestals. Sometimes they're shorter than that, but they do have pedestals which make them hang off the main stems of the inflorescence. Okay, next slide. So again, the Western New York prism has this good comparison chart between different species. So on the left is slender false brome, and you can see the big characteristics there is spikelets have no stalk. So you want to look for lumping grass, forming a monoculture, with the inflorescence arching over, and the stalk and the spikelets have no stalk. But the other ones do have short or long stalks on. Okay. Here's a photograph by Audrey Bow at Cornell of uh, Danby State Forest, and here's Brachypodium, slender false brome, starting to make a monoculture in the woods there. It does spread easily. Those those uh, spikelets produce uh, flowers that are carried away by animals, probably deer. Uh, maybe rabbits and on humans in their shoes and pants. And you'll often see these monocultures starting along trails. Next 
Next slide. And here's a monoculture that's in flower. So you can see all those arching inflorescences coming off the clumps of grass there. So if you're walking through the woods, you don't often see a monoculture of clumping grasses with arching inflorescences like this. So that's when you should be tipped off that, well, maybe this is Brachypodium and you should either take a specimen or some good photographs. Okay. And here's the map of where they occur out in Western New York. And there's a group and Central New York from Syracuse down to Ithaca. First, we only knew this plant from Virgin Swamp in near Rochester. And then when people started to get out there and look, they started to find it more. So this is a good one to survey out in Western, Central and Western New York. If you look down in Dutchess County in the lower Hudson Prison, there is a population that popped up along Wappingers Creek down there. So it's another area we wanna do some more surveys. Okay, and if you'd like to get more involved in in uh, and get trained to how to look for it, there is a uh, Great Lakes Slender False Broom Working Group, which meets every couple of times a year, and they've gotten money from um, they've gotten grants to to do surveys out in uh, central and western New York. So. If you'd like to help them out, you can get in contact through the Western New York Prism. And you can see that photograph at the bottom. That's a really big monoculture. You can see it just takes over the whole forest floor. We're really concerned about what it has the potential to do to our forest understories. Okay, that's it for the species. And I'll hand it back over to Mitch to tell you more. Thank you. Um, I will open it up to questions in just a second. Um, I was going to do this, uh, uh, a brief demo of some of the stuff you can do on IMAP online. Um, I just refreshed my page, so that's going to load for a little bit. Um, so I think I will save this for after the question period. Um, so I think I will just open it up to questions. So thank you so much for joining us. We're very happy to have had you with us today. Um, you can enter questions into the chat box. Um, if you're interested in unmuting yourself, we can also figure out how to do it that way as well. And I just want to mention that you can email me at that email, imapinvasives.dec.my.gov. Um, you can also visit our website at nyimapinvasives.org. And I'd just like to let you know that we have some more webinars coming up. So if anyone here is involved with water chestnut poles, we have a call on how to record those in IMAP and why that might be interesting for us. Um, and also we're doing the Invasive Species Mapping Challenge in June, and we're kicking that off with a webinar on June 24th. And you can uh, register for those and see upcoming webinars on that website, uh, nyimapinvasives.org slash webinar dash training. And you can follow us on social media at nyimapinvasives on Facebook and Instagram. And also please uh, look to your prisms as well for other sorts of events. Um, we have New York I saw coming up, uh, Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, if anyone is in the Slilo prism, uh, I am collaborating on a webinar on Friday about uh, some key species in that region. So if you're in Slilo, feel free to come to that, but also look at whatever prism you are a part of, because there are lots of good webinar series going on right now. And so now I'll open it up to questions. Um, hi, Mitchell, this is Meg. I did unmute myself and I'm afraid my cat notices that he needs some attention, so I apologize. <laughs> um, there was one specific question in the chat box um, that I thought you might want to look at, and I did send you a couple quick thoughts from me in the chat box. Um, 
I also will let people know we are uh, able to stay on after two o'clock for anyone who was not successful at submitting their fake species record and they want to. Mitchell and I can work one on one with people and figure out, you know, where the troubleshoot part is. Um, yeah. Mitchell, the um, question at hand has to do with uh, the advanced data. Um, so I did cover that poly, um, polygons and treatment data um, is what we consider the advanced world. Um, and that you can do that online. The website is what they call mobile responsive. So if you're in an area that has connectivity, you can actually submit treatment data through the create record tool online. If you need to be able to work offline in areas where there is not connectivity with that IMAP mobile advanced, I suggested people can email you and we can get them that handout and a link for the recorded webinar. Um, but then yeah. someone also had a question about um, uh, then what would happen? Can you download an export and all? And online, there is an export tool. And Mitchell, I would defer to you to, I know that treatment details are not visible by people outside of an organization, but the fact that mm -hmm. there's a treatment record is, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I see the record, just not the detail. And then, yes, you can absolutely export your own data. Um, there is an export tool. We have had a couple of bugs with it this spring. So if anything doesn't come out the way you expect, please let us know. Um, I think that answers all the advanced and AGOL questions. Great. But are you, you have the chat box open now, right? Yes. Okay, I, I'm going to mute and um, there's a couple more questions there you might want to take and I see Steve has covered a couple. Okay. There's a question about uh, hybridization between different Aurelia species. Steve does not know of any. I'm scrolling from the, the most recent questions to the questions from earlier. So. Uh, bear with me if you asked a question a while ago. Um, if anyone wants to create organizations or projects, um, you have the ability to create projects, um, organizations in IMAP, you need to email me and then I'll create it for you. So that IMAP and bases at dec.ny.gov. Okay, I think that's it. I think I covered the others with um questions and I see the last thing in the chat box is actually a comment, not a question. Hey, look at that. It's 159. I do see one question about um, how to get rid of uh, Japanese Angelica. I don't know if Steve has any information or if we would just point them to their PRISM website for more information. Well, whoever asked that, I would suggest going to the, your PRISM's website because they have a lot of experience dealing with invasive species in uh, regions across New York State. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Let me know if you, if anyone's having problems with the app and you need us to stay on. Well, I'm seeing lots of thank yous and I am not seeing anyone who says they need help. <laughs> That's great. Okay. 